In today's episode of Tristan Take Video, three easy training sessions that you guys can use to improve your FTP on the bike with World Tour Cycling Coach, John Wakefield. John has previously been a performance coach at Team UAE and helped Tadej Pogacar secure his two Tour de France victories in 2020 and 2021. This year, John is working with Team Bora Hansgrohe while simultaneously running the Science to Sport Lab here in the center of Girona. Science to Sport deals with bike fitting, rider coaching, and performance analysis. And in this video, I'm gonna ask him some questions about the importance of improving one's FTP for cycling performance, how you can train your FTP if you don't have a power meter or a heart rate monitor. And we also get some insights from John as to how much a regular average everyday cyclist can improve with consistent training. Before we jump into this episode, I do need to mention that I did have some microphone issues when recording this interview. And unfortunately, the audio is not great. I have done my best to improve it in post-production, but if you hear anything odd there, that is why. So having said that, I hope you guys will enjoy this episode. This is three easy ways to improve your functional threshold power with World Tour Cycling Coach John Wakefield. Let's do it. So welcome to this episode of Tristan Take Video. As I said in that intro there, today we're talking about three different ways that you can improve your functional threshold power while on the bike. I'm sitting with John Wakefield, who is my coach, but also a coach for many very good athletes. Again, as you would have seen in that intro there, uh, you've worked with some riders who are going to the Vuelta, who have been at the Tour de France, who have yep. been going very well at the Giro. Before we get into what the three sessions are today, can you explain to me what functional threshold power is and the relevance of this to one cycling performance yeah just as as a general functional threshold power is obviously your predictor of performance and, and a good go-to value to prescribe training over and above that in terms of power values and what you get at true functional threshold power is typically your 60 minute power of what you can sustain for 60 minutes however obviously there are different ways to get to that value the most common one is your 20 minute all-out test and you take 95 percent of that can you explain why the ftp number is not the be all and end all because some people have a lower ftp but they perform really well in other ways yep. Although, uh, as we said earlier, like it, it seems to be the, the holy grail. It is important, but at the same time, it's, it's definitely not. For, for me, it's not the holy grail because if you fresh, your FTP is X. You do three, four weeks of training and your FTP is Y because you cannot sustain that. So the question comes in is, what is your actual true value? You do have guys like a sprinter will typically have a lower FTP, but a much higher peak power value. Where you get a Grand Tour rider, they have a very high threshold, but typically not always a very high peak power value. So it really depends on, on your discipline and, and where you're at. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Okay, so today we're talking about three different sessions that one can do in order to improve FTP. Now, as we just said, FTP isn't everything and training just your FTP is not going to mean that you all of a sudden become a great cyclist. It just means you will have a better FTP than you had, but it is a really good way of tracking progression within your yeah. cycling. So if you start with a certain FTP number, you can always test yourself and you can refer back to that original number to give you some level of progress going on, yep. correct? Correct. If the number increases ever so slightly, if it's five, 10%, you've had progression. However, if it stays the same, but yet you've lost five kilos maybe, then obviously your watts per kilo go up. So again, it's, it's a great tool to track progression or the opposite of, of regression if things aren't going so good for you. True, true. Obviously, you need a starting point as well. So before we do this, I do need to mention, I made a video a couple of years ago about how to test your FTP, how to set your FTP. I'll put a link up to it in the, the top corner here so you can have a watch of that. But once you have tested your FTP, you've given yourself a base number, which is your 20 minutes times 0.95. What is the first session that you would recommend someone does to improve their FTP? Uh, it would probably be two sessions which are a really standard and uncomplicated would be three by 10 minutes. And the power that you would be looking at would be say 95 to 105% of that FTP value. So it would be 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off, 10 minutes on. Uh, three times and the second one to that also very very simple to session would be two by or three by 15 same protocol 95 to 105 percent of FTP 15 minutes on if you're feeling good 10 minutes off or maybe 15 minutes um, and repeat 
To start out, I would say twice a week, typically sort of two days, two days apart, so you have adequate rest, providing you don't go smash those next two days, leading into, the third, into that second session. When you are really accustomed and you are starting to feel good as a bit of an advance, you can do three days. In saying that, again, just leave adequate time in between those sessions so you can recover. So when you're doing those sessions, you're hitting the numbers, you're hitting the stimulus, and you're getting that adaptation from that session. In terms of duration, anything three to four weeks, one week recovery and repeat. Okay, cool. So just before we jump into the second session, give me your opinion on what do you think having a very good FTP is good for? Like in terms of climbing or time trialing or what kind of rider needs a good FTP? Every rider in a way needs an FTP. So, you know, if you take it as a pure sprinter, unless it's a dead flat race like Tour of Oman or something like that, you still need to be able to get over climbs or medium mountains as an example and be fresher than the next sprinter by the time that uh, sprint comes at the end. If you're kind of really on the rivet on those climbs because you have a slightly lower threshold value, you're going to the line a lot more depleted. So it kind of works for everyone, but obviously what you do want to have if you are a Grand Tour rider, a climber, sort of the, the higher the FTP, the, the easier it is for you at the end of the day. So as John said, everyone needs to have a reasonable FTP to get through a ride. It's only really probably track sprinters that need to be super on and off if they're a sprinter, but even the best world tour sprinters are still going to have a five and a half watt per kilo FTP so they can get over yep. climbs in, in hilly stages. Yep. Or, or, or make the time cut. Or make the time cut. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it is, it's a very important element of the cycling training puzzle. Sure. So with that being said, let's jump into session number two. What's yep. the second session that you've gone for once people have learned how to do their sort of 10 minutes or 15 minutes? Second one would be sort of over-unders, so of that stochastic nature. So if you take uh, also three by 10 minutes, but your first 10 minutes, second and third is slightly different. Instead of holding that constant 10 minutes or the constant 15 minutes, you would do say two minutes at 90%, maybe 95 if you're feeling better and well trained then you would do one minute at 105 to 110 percent in well trained you can go 110 115 and you have that sort of like over under of nature um, for up to 10 minutes you said yeah 10 minutes is, is always a good one if you do sort of get comfortable and get used to those you can do 20 minutes 20 minutes is typically three minutes constant at say 90 95 percent and then you'll do two minutes at 105 110 for those over under sessions during that 10 or the 20 minutes, remember you're doing that three times. So 10 minutes on, 10 minutes recovery, 10 minutes on, 10 minutes recovery. Or if you're doing say 20 minutes, it'll be 20 minutes on, typically 15 minutes recovery, and then repeat another 20 minutes. So in total, should a rider be aiming for a certain amount of minutes of threshold work per week? You said before, maybe two sessions a week. Do you think someone can burn themselves out by doing too many of them, say in a week? Yeah, you know, definitely. if you spent 90 minutes at threshold per week, that's a lot of time at threshold. Threshold. Sure, like you, you just don't want to overload the system and fatigue the system so you're not hitting the numbers, you're not getting the stimulus and essentially you don't adapt to that load and then have progression. How I kind of explain to people what training is because theoretically more is always better is what everyone says is to me training is like you hit your head against the wall, so essentially you're training, and then you cut your head, your head open, and then there's like a gash and there's blood. The only way you stop that and letting it heal is by stopping hitting your head against a wall. And then the blood stops, you'll create a scar because your body goes, well, I need the stronger in case I get hit again. And that's why you create a scar. So training is the same thing. It's kind of hitting your head against a wall when you're training. The only way your body gets stronger is when you stop and your body goes like, I need to protect myself in case this happens again. You get stronger and then you can hit your head against a wall again. Yeah, this is really good advice. Not yeah. the hitting your head against the wall. Yeah, I wouldn't hit your head against the wall, but that's kind of like in layman's terms how I look at it. No, that's a good way of looking yeah. at it. I mean, it is, it's, that's the whole premise of training is breaking down those muscle fibers, getting them to repair yep. stronger so you yep. can go harder again next time. Correct. Okay, cool. So really what we're trying to say here is for you guys, rest is actually the key component of training. It's yep. not just the training. The rest is as equally as important as the training itself. Tell me, what is your third session that you've got for people if they've done plenty of those 10 minutes, they've done plenty of over-unders, a third session that's something that is, is critical
people for the piece, the piece of the puzzle. The third and, and final and probably the most important piece in, in all of this puzzle is not actually a session on the bike, it's what you do off the bike. So consistency is key. Like you need to have consistent training. If you don't have consistent training, it's not gonna happen. It doesn't matter what sessions you do. I'm a prime example of it. I'll ride for a week and smash myself. I feel great. And then I do nothing for three weeks and I'm, I'm back to square one. So post a child for that. And that is key. The other one is making sure that you're fueling for your sessions. So you're not trying to lose weight, trying to increase FTP or peak power, whatever the case may be. Your body is a motor, you need to fuel it. You want the consistency, if you fueled for the consistency of the sessions, you'll complete the sessions, you'll get the stimulus, you'll walk away happy. The other side is understanding that not every session is going to be a PB. It's impossible. If it is, then something is, is going wrong. So if you're having a bad day on the bike and you have an interval session and you're not hitting it or feeding it exactly like you are, sometimes it's best to still complete the session, but you just lower the value of the power. So say you mean to do 300 watts, but 280 is sustainable, just go through the motions and finish it. Again, it's your consistency. You will get the load, you will get the stimulus, and later on that will become progressive adaptation. So what you're saying with the consistency as well is someone is better off committing to one FTP session a week mm. rather than three in one week and then not riding for the next two weeks. Yeah, which is my program. Isn't yeah. <laughs> the Don Wakefield <laughs> yeah, personal yeah. program. Try to make your personal gold program. Do as yeah. he says, not as he does. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think that's a really important point it's because true. I have lots of people contact me, to be honest, I'm sure they contact you as well and they say, hey, like I'm smashing it this week, I feel so great, this is awesome, I'm loving the sport, all this sort of stuff. Yeah. But then two weeks later they've dropped off and I think it's important not to overload yourself too soon with the excitement of I'm going to improve my FTP and then finding I'm, I'm actually exhausted. Commit to, for example, the one session a week. You can do it on the home training, you can do it outside, but make sure you get that one done per week if that's all you've got time for and do it for four weeks and you'll notice a difference rather than yeah. three in a week and then nothing for three weeks. And then also just pay attention to stuff like staying healthy, don't get sick, because obviously when you train, it's a stress on the body, immune function sometimes does compromise, so just make sure again that you're eating, sleeping, living well, stay consistent, recover, make sure that the easy days are easy and that you're not going interval session, smashing a group ride, back trying going into another interval session, you know, space it out and just you know, gain consistency and, and recovery is key. So that's a sort of a third session along with those first two. Now I want to ask you, like we said in the video that we did last time about five key training sessions that yes. people can do, you gave us a, a, a bonus one which was the 3015s which yes. just sounded like a grim session. I still haven't done it. I don't want to do it. If someone was like just ramp me up, ramp up my FTP, give me a session that's brutal and is going to help my FTP or just again give us another session that would be the sort of be all end all session. So if you make a 10 minute block, so again, three by tens, in that 10 minute I would do, the first 10 minutes is all out, vomit on the side of the road, hard as you can go, like absolutely give it everything you got. 10 minutes recovery, then within that second and the third 10 minutes, I would do five minutes at 100% of threshold, and then at the end of that five minutes, I would do five minutes of 40 20s. 40 seconds all out, 20 second recovery, 40 seconds all out, <laughs> until the end of the 10 minutes, and then recovery, and then repeat that second one again. Yeah. That sounds pretty grim, although not as grim as 30 15, so. Yeah, nothing as grim 30, as 30 15. Yeah. 30, 15. I don't really want to try it, but it is interesting to know that that'll help your FTP as well, because I guess that's a function of everything around your FTP. You're training yeah, all the numbers correct. around your FTP there. And, and, and you'd be significantly over FTP. Yes, on the 40s, you land up only kind of doing about 115, 120% if you're really on it. And then when you're recovering, you're all the way back down. So you take it as an average and you're sort of just on that upper end, typically of what we see on threshold. So so one more thing I just want to ask you about as well, because I am interested now, is that what's an average if someone was able to train a few days a week, worked on this FTP session, what are they lifting their FTP to in a watts per kilo sense? It, it's actually a hard question or there, there like is no definitive answer on that. So 
with obviously someone if they're really untrained and by untrained I mean they haven't really trained they've just been riding a bike they've had no structured training or producing structured now doing the three by tens you'll obviously see a significant change especially in that first year because they're having that adaptation where the catch comes in is that say someone like yourself you've got years of load years of training and stuff in you to then increase it will be a lot harder and a lot less than what someone that hasn't been training so to say what is the number that they can go to I, I, I'll never give someone yeah, that answer okay. like yeah. to be honest it, it's impossible if some coach tells you oh we'll increase your FTP by 20% or 10% snake oil salesman like I'm sorry to say you, it's impossible to say that yeah so you can't really give me an average of what anyone would be aiming for because every human is different and their training loads are different and their experience and background and all of that kind of thing can you just tell me then what are the FTPs of some of the best athletes that you've worked with and did you find after a couple of years of work you were able to increase it or are you looking at tiny 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 fractions of marginal increases there yeah so if you take like a well-trained athlete like like a world tour athlete you're looking for like two three percent in terms of performance a year if i take an athlete i worked with this year he went pre-season he went from 5.6 watts a kilo and i tested him now like literally the other day because we're going into vault and he was on 6.1 also he was three kilos lighter now than what he was yeah everything increased you know so but it was it was a strong focus towards the end of the year but again like you typically then at next year and that you look at sort of like two maybe three percent for someone young like different or untrained maybe five percent you know but you got to remember that the difference of five percent is either you know 300 or 315 watts like if you are doing whatever you are now maximally for 20 minutes and i tell you well just add five percent onto that it's a huge number and that's what people don't understand like to find three percent is 45 seconds quicker up a climb you know so what is important for anybody whether you're a professional or just the general rider or age grouper is that if you take on a coach or if you start coaching yourself in that in that first year from being sort of untrained you may see quite a big improvement in your performances and rightfully so because it's a new stimulus and everything is great what does happen though is typically after three years you sort of at your physiological peak to a point and you may not see the gains that you have been making and where the key then comes in if you are with a coach is how good that coaching is to make those very small gains so are you making two percent that year in year four maybe another two two percent in year five but then you may not improve the power but you may improve consistency so are you doing five climbs at 300 watts where before you were doing 310 300 290 280 250 yeah you know because then essentially if you're in a race you are out the back if you're not doing it consistently you know you land up in two minutes back so where you're key in, in any coaching or any type of performance improvements is sort of after that three years to make improvements going forward from that yeah. but as i said it may not be going numbers numbers it may then becoming consistent and consistency essentially is speed i find also with the Im improvement along with that consistency i guess the other word for it is durability you know yep. being able to sure. go like i found over years of developing my ftp i've been able to go harder deeper into events sure. whereas at the, when i you know was first starting training seven or eight years ago i had a good 20 minute power but then i couldn't do that after three <laughs> or four hours of riding for sure know? so that's something important to remember is that with the improvement in ftp over time is that you do get that sort of that deep strength that you need either at the end of races or just that make guys great cyclists if they're out with their mates their yeah. ability to go just as hard at the end as they were like an important part of world tour and, and that pro conti level and, and even on the mountain bike marathon stuff a very strong metric and stuff that i look at is as you mentioned your durability so what an athlete produces after 3,000 kilojoules of work 4,000 5,000 if it's a key stage you know if you're sitting on the queen stage at a grand tour and you're already on 5,000 kilojoules of, of usage what is their best 20 minute in relation to their 20 minute being fresh where i try zero percent change is ideal is dream. your gold standard is your dream <laughs> but uh, i try work on sort of maximum five percent but typically in that sort of zero to three uh, percent range ladies will too i look at typically like 1800 kilojoules of work and what their 5 15 and 20 minute maximals are for that there alone if you do that you've already improved you know obviously shorter races less less energy consumption but it's also a way of, of tracking improvements
Yeah, yeah, cool to hear. Okay, cool. So as we've just discussed uh, a bunch of things about FTP, I want to also ask you a question about if someone doesn't have a power meter and they still want to train to improve their FTP, do you recommend they use heart rate? Do you recommend some other metric? What's the answer there if they don't have a power meter? Yeah, you can always definitely use heart rate. You know, history before power meters, people use heart rate. The one uh, thing just to consider and take into account is obviously heart rate is subjective. You know, so if you fatigue, your heart rate doesn't elevate if it's hot it elevates etc so just pay attention to that but using something as simple as an rpe value you know for threshold efforts is good you want to be a sort of seven and a half eight and a half out of ten as a as an effort as a feeling you know if you're doing the over unders you could do seven and a half rpe and then on the harder ones being nine out of ten another metric to use is if you have a, a hill that you typically or a climb that you typically always use for your for your intervals and your go-to like you can use VAM as a value and obviously if you're climbing at say an 1100 VAM at your threshold you would get to whatever this road sign and obviously the more you progress you'll go past the same road sign maybe 20 meters on same F, same RPE and you just go better so there, there are different ways of doing it but you can also if your heart rate zones 172 to 180 if that's where you have it as threshold you can always always use that as a marker that's interesting to know I really like that idea of either using VAM or RPE what I found really interesting is in the video that I released recently about climbing rock Corba as quick as I could you had said to me to climb climb it using RPE, not anything else. Yep, and I climbed it to RPE and it actually worked perfectly because sure. had I climbed to power, I would have actually gone slower, I think, because the, the way the, the climb was structured, it meant that if I just stuck at one power value the entire way, mm. I don't think I would have hit the speed that I needed to For hit. Sure. Whereas with the rate of perceived exertion, I was able to just work my body in a different way and that actually ended up, it did work out yeah. well. Okay, cool. So that is a really good piece of advice writing to VAM and, and uh, rate of perceived exertion. Now, just before we wrap up, do you have one last piece of advice that you could give people who are going out maybe training for the first time or training their FTP, or even if they have been training for a little while and they want some insight from a World Tour coach, what's, uh, what's one last piece of training advice that you would have for people? Don't rush it. Like when you're forcing form or trying to chase form, it typically works in a negative way. You overdo it and you actually have a negative result. Cycling in general or training is, it's a lot of work for a small reward, but that small reward is a big reward as, as an athlete. So don't rush it and don't complicate things. Just use your ABCs as they say. Okay, yeah, cool. Cycling is such a long journey and the process of training is a massive journey over many years. So yeah. there's no gains really to be had by rushing it. And there's only potential losses. Yep. I want to say thanks as always for being in this episode. Pleasure. And I uh, hope you guys have enjoyed this one. If you have, make sure to chuck a like on it. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you are interested in more training videos and definitely leave a comment down below about something that you got out of this video so I know that you guys have learned something and I'm on the right track with making these training videos and John's not wasting his time having a chat with me every so often <laughs> to make them. Thanks again. And I'll see you guys all in the next episode of Tristan Take Video very soon. All right, thanks guys. Cheers guys. Ciao.